I got an email from a student saying, your job is so cool. You change people's lives. You changed mine. And it's sort of, that's what I'm excited about is being able to continually do that and support those students in, in making that happen. Good day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Marina Hortman. This is the podcast for Australian international educators. G'day and I'm Rob Maliki and we are on Garrigal land today in Sydney. Our guest is also on Garrigal land. Thank you for your company today, wherever you're joining us from. Today's guest is Michelle Coford from the University of New South Wales. She's the lead for learning abroad short programs and study abroad. Michelle, thank you for joining us on Global Horizons. Lovely to be here. Awesome to have you here. Look, Rob, it was actually interesting because before we got onto the podcast this morning, I was having a look at Michelle's profile on LinkedIn and I almost fell off my chair because it says you've been at UNSW for 30 years and I thought, surely you're too young and that's not possible. I was trying to picture you there as a 10-year-old. <laughs> I started when I was five, yes. That's that's a genius. That makes more sense. That's my story and I stick to it, yeah. No, honestly, I was, I was really taken aback because I really could not have imagined. But tell us about how you first started there. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting journey. It's very long and involved, but I started at the university. I actually started studying at the University of Sydney and I studied a Bachelor of Science Honours and I majored in histology and biochemistry, of all things. My first job was to do the photomicroscopy for a computer-based program and, as with all projects, ran out of funding for the programming. So I then did instructional design and multimedia and learned to do computer-based training for students. So we were taking photos of slides, putting them on a computer-based program, and then the students would learn through the computer instead of photo microscopy. Then I moved into sort of an imaging area and then education side of things. So I worked for Associate Dean's into education And one of the big things that we were looking at is graduate attributes. And that's where I became quite passionate in global citizenship and how students could engage with the the world, not just their discipline. So, you know, it was important. And the graduate attributes of becoming self-reliant and team building and all of those things. And so I've moved throughout the different faculties. I was in business, I was in science and then eventually moved to the international, which I've been in for 13 years in the learning abroad team. So doing short programs and new Colombo plan and all of those fun things we do in learning abroad net these days. Hasn't it changed so much in the last two decades, really? The, the, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about the graduate attributes stuff Definitely. that, that you're, you're talking about. You know, extracurricular in, you know, back in the late 90s and early 2000s was like, drinking at the uni bar (laughs) (laughs) and now it's really serious so tell us more yeah and I've seen that progression and both in and out of the classroom so you know graduate attributes over the last you know 15 years it was there was a lot more focus at the universities about embedding them in the curricula as well as the co-curricula and then the extracurricular so you know the uni bar is the extracurricular or the the clubs and societies but that's where you know learning abroad gives them all those capabilities that they wouldn't get just sitting in a classroom learning texts or traditional lectures the education has evolved in the fact that it's a more holistic approach to learning it's not just about content delivery it's about teaching students the the skills that will set them up We often say that, you know, graduate attributes is the thing that will get you fired if you haven't actually learnt how to do those things. Okay, so before we get into too much detail about learning abroad, how about about we just go to the top level of learning abroad and and just talk a little bit about what it actually is and what it entails. So at New South, what what do you guys consider learning abroad to be? So for UNSW, learning abroad is sort of an encompassing term for all our programs where students either go abroad or either come to UNSW for non-award short programs. 
So for the outbound area, it includes exchange, the traditional exchange program, but then short programs could be anything from a short course, summer or winter programs at a host institution. It could be international internships, placements, industrial training for engineering. We also consider things like conferences, some volunteer and research. They'd be the main things for outbound learning abroad and a lot of faculty-led programs. And then inbound, we've got the traditional exchange, study abroad, where students pay fees to UNSW for a short-term period. And we also have a research practicum. So the term learning abroad is all-encompassing for all of those areas for us. And to what extent is that stuff managed out of your office as opposed to being managed out in the faculties? The majority of the exchange, study abroad, all the incoming programs are managed through our office. The outbound programs exchange short programs with partner relations and third-party providers are managed in our office. Most of the faculty-led programs are done within the faculties. However, we support all programs with the pre-departure material. It's standardised across anyone that's going abroad. Work integrated learning, we have a central division called Will Central, and they manage a lot of the outbound placement areas, but we support them as far as, once again, the pre-departure and also funding through the new Colombo plan. How many students do you manage with your team? Outbound pre-COVID, we were just under maybe 5,000 students a year going outbound. And in wow, inbound, I think it's about 2,500. Yeah, wow, those are big numbers. Yeah. That means a lot of complexity, doesn't it? It does. A lot of complexity. We have the complication of or the advantage that we've got a three-term system, a three-plus a summer. We have four intakes of incoming students a year. We have rolling admissions for research students. And then we have several different time. We basically rolling times of when students can go outbound throughout the year. So there's a lot of coming and going at any one time. And what's the size of your team, of the Learning Abroad team? 11 staff members. Which immediately makes me start to think think about you, like the fact you guys must be doing something right in terms of managing volume and complexity. Knowing, of course, that that stuff always seems overwhelming, but clearly you've got good systems and processes in place. Maybe we can dive into that a bit because everybody in their work, whether in learning abroad or not, has to deal with levels of complexity and volume. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think about those things, Michelle, in your work about dealing with volume and complexity? Definitely. It's, it's an evolution over the years, but one of the things is using technology. So you know, what are the things where we could outsource? We we don't have additional staff, we don't have additional resources, but we can use technology to outsource a lot of those things and streamline the processes. A lot of processes are manual where we had to individually enrol students, for example, that are incoming. So looking at systems and processes of where students could self-enrol rather than us having to do it manually. The other thing is looking at every all of the processes that we do and what's the purpose of it. So if we're collecting data and putting it in something and it's a manual process, do we actually do anything with that data? Do we need to do it any longer? So trying to get rid of those things that we were doing for historic, I always say for historical or hysterical reasons we were doing them. And so now's the time to sort of look at things and, well, not now, but all the time reevaluating what are we doing and why are we doing it you know if we're not if we're collecting feedback and not doing anything with it we need to change and start doing things with it or change the way and we get, can use it can it be automated can students write stuff and we automatically put it into a testimonials or automate those processes and that's where we use custom built system that we have called endeavor for a lot of the management and we've used extensively Entreport for a lot of the outbound short programs and new Colombo plan funding. Can I talk a little bit more about that process of deciding what what processes you you, you keep or you, you cut? How do you how do you manage that? How do you approach that? Is that like an annual review where the whole team sits down and you look across the board or is it literally that you know you you're trying to encourage people to constantly think 
about the actions they're taking and and whether or not it, it can be improved or, or or retired altogether. I've actually got a meeting request, the meeting reminder that comes up every Monday at eight thirty to my whole team that says, what's the one thing you can do this week that'll make next week easier? And so it's just a constant reminder, you know, ideally you'd think about, okay, what have I got to do this week? What's the one thing that I can do while I'm doing it that streamlines? And it depends on the week and it might be processing confirmation of enrolment and that's requiring a lot of things. So sit back, what can we do to streamline it and then go and do it? If we're getting a lot of inquiries from students about something, then write a draft template that we can use all the time to send out to students when they ask that same question. But even one step further, going back to our resources and change the resources. So change the Moodle tutorial, change the emails that they will be getting so that next time they get it, that question's answered before they even ask it. We, we haven't worked out how, how to get the students to read the information yet, but... <laughs> 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 so a shout out to any listeners here who've actually managed to figure out how to get students to read materials. You are welcome as a guest anytime on this podcast. I like the question you ask. I think it's a very good way to phrase it because it makes everyone be very proactive in terms of thinking about how to improve things and not just getting them done here and now, but how, how you can constantly improve the way you work and, and such an easy way to to phrase it and have it on a recurrent basis I think is great. We, we do do periodic reviews of you know the processes and we try and change it in the instance that we find a problem. We're working with the Global Society for example on having a spreadsheet where we can the minute there's an issue we submit it otherwise we think about it we talk about it but it, nothing ever changes so it's about being proactive and change it when you identify the problem instead of waiting for an annual review and we still do do annual reviews or maybe every two years or every six months depending on the program and the process if it's working to, don't mess with it. But if it's, something's not working, then sometimes we need to go back to scratch and sort of think, okay, if we built this again, how would we do it? So let's take that a step further. I'm, I'm fascinated. This is such a funny thing. Like if, if, we, if you went back 10 years and said that one day I would be fascinated in task management and how to organize your day, right? You're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so Cloudy, if anyone doesn't know on this podcast, Maureen and I are married and we also ran AIM overseas. It was a very successful learning abroad program for a provider for 13 years. So Maureen has seen things evolve in my workload. I was just not a person to like document tasks and things like that to begin with, but I've, I've come to love it. How do you manage that day-to-day workload, task management and things? A series of different things. So previously what we used to do is try and have manuals for everything. So we, in learning abroad, there's also a regular changeover of staff. So it's really important that you document processes. <clears throat> also because of the life cycle of things, you might do something once. It might be one fund, funding round or one special grant that you don't do again for another 12 months. And it's so easy to forget what the processes were that you did. So documentation is the biggest thing. So we used to have manuals, but now we're sort of moving to, we're putting processes in Entreport so that we can actually document our processes and they're small chunks rather than a long big manual. And you can just go in and see each of the individual sections. For the day-to-day things, I actually use Planner. It's a project management tools similar to Asana. There's a lot of them on the market, but I use Planner because it's linked in with Microsoft Office. So I can set things and if I have a high priority in in an email, it automatically feeds into Planner. So it's a way of doing it. So we'll have a a card where we list the the things that have to be done within that project and we, you can assign it to people, you can put deadlines on it, and it sort of helps the workflow. And then it's not me reminding staff that something needs to be done, it's the system will automatically send reminders as well. I don't like to nag. <laughs> really tactically, how do you approach your day? Do you, do you sort of come in and sit down and look through Planner, look ahead at what's coming up? Is that a weekly process? How, how does that look for you? Both. So I do it as a weekly process of, okay, what are the deadlines that are coming up? What what do I need to have accomplished today? 
I have a running sheet in planner of what's the critical things today <laughs> sort of thing. Sometimes that critical things today gets moved along the baskets of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because I used to have a to-do list, but it became a novel and it was a work of fiction. I'd never get through it. I have everything in planner, but it, that's a best case scenario. And then I have a separate card. That's what's the urgent stuff that has to be done. And so it's more about priority management than time management not having just a list of things to do, but having a a shiftable list of things to do. And that's where something like Planner or Asana, you can move the priorities. It might be a priority today, but something else comes in that's a higher priority. So it's constantly shifting and juggling the priorities, priority management rather than time management. I promise listeners that we will get out of this detail in a moment. I just love workload management. I, I think all of us don't spend enough time really thinking about how to organize ourselves better and there's so much efficiency to be gained and i know you do this so well michelle which is why i'm keen to pick your brain let's let's add another element to this sort of workload management which is the tsunami that is email how do you handle it that's always a challenging one i use categories so we use outlook and outlook's got a category feature So I have different projects, different colour coded, different categories. And so first thing in the morning, I'll come in and just categorise them. On my commute to work, I'll actually get my phone and I'll say, hey, Siri, read the emails and it'll read the titles to me. So I know what emails are in my desk if I haven't checked them while I'm driving sort of thing. And then I categorise them and I try and chunk them as much as possible. So work through emails in chunks rather than as they come in. That doesn't always happen. I try to be disciplined, but I'll be honest, it doesn't always happen. And But I find by categorising, then I can sort by category. And then, for instance, if it's funding, then I can block out a time to work through all the funding ones. If it's a risk assessment, I can work through all the risk assessments. So chunking and categorising, I do. I used to have a million inboxes, folders where I'd move everything and I thought that's a waste of time. So now I just use the categories and I've got a folder called the year and that's it. (laughs) So once it's actioned, it moves into the year folder and I decided that categorising is a click, one click, whereas, you know, finding folders when you've got endless stream of folders is dragging and finding where they are. Then trying to search in those folders was difficult. So I just have one one folder for the whole year and it's all categorized by labels. Fantastic advice, Michelle. I'm, I'm keen to now move on to the new Colombo plan because you've got heaps of experience with the new Colombo plan. For those who are listening that might not be familiar with it, if you're from outside learning abroad, new Colombo plan is an Australian government scholarship program started in 2013 and it has two components. The first is a, an elite, if you like, scholarship program for about 100 to 150 best and brightest students from around Australia. They get funded like up to $60,000 to spend up to 18 or 19 months out in the Indo-Pacific region studying, doing internships, mentorships, language training. And then the other side of that is a mobility program where universities apply for grants and there's about 10,000 students a year receive funding from the Australian government to have other sorts of experiences around the Indo-Pacific region. On the subject of NCP, New Colombo Plan, Michelle, what changes have you seen in learning abroad in the 10 years since it's been implemented? I think the biggest change that I've seen is the destination choices. So prior to the New Colombo Plan coming Our biggest market was students wanting to go on exchange, wanting to go to the US, UK and Canada. While that hasn't changed significantly and students still want to do that for exchange, there's been a big shift that, for instance, China is now our number one destination across all learning abroad programs. And that's because we've had a significant amount of funding in the short-term spaces for China, India, Indonesia. So there's been a big shift from where students are going because they do tend to follow the money. But not only that, there's more and more programs, study tours being offered from faculties because they've been able to instigate programs with the funding. 
We've also seen a shift in the students that go. So not only the students that could afford to go, it it has actually opened doors on accessibility. So we're seeing more students that wouldn't have normally travelled and they probably may not still go on exchange, but they can go on those short-term programs. So we've seen a significant increase in the short-term programs that are available for students. We've probably got a lot more programs than we had we definitely have a lot more programs than we what we would have had 10 years ago. So there's new initiatives coming out. There's really cool things that students can do now, whereas there was just maybe a select few study tours, the exchange, and there was a limited of options. So there's an increase in options, increase of where they can go and increase in diversity of the types of students that can go on the programs. So it's made a big impact. And is the impact still true now post-COVID? Because we've seen quite a rise in terms of the prices of airline tickets. It's been getting dearer to travel. And of course, those kind of trips need to be organised in advance. Does it work for the students? Do you see a shift or is that still fine? It's still recovering, let's put it that way. One of the advantages of COVID, if we can call it that, (laughs) is that with the new Colombo plan, we're able to switch to some virtual programmes. And we're able to increase diversity from that. So students that can't afford to go on the travel programs, we're able to do virtual programs. And with the return to travel, we're finding that if we can still keep a virtual option open, it may not be funded, but it's a lot cheaper option for some students. So we're trying to keep that diversity by having virtual opportunities as well. I think that The funding still does assist students go and it doesn't cover all their expenses. As you say, the the accommodation's more expensive, flights are more expensive. So they are having to contribute more. So it's being a little bit slower to recover, but I think it will recover. They've they've had two years to save money to travel. (laughs) They haven't been able to travel for several years, but Economically, it, it is tough for students. It is getting more challenging. So we, we're fortunate that we've got a lot of NCP funds to assist the students as much as possible. They can also then consider the OS help in conjunction with the NCP, so it's nearly all paid off. But we are seeing an increased resistance in students wanting to add more debt to their HEX. So that's been a shift since post-COVID. All of this extra programming lots more extra programming, lots more funding. That means a greater need for central offices such as yours to collaborate with faculties. Is that a fair assessment? Definitely, yes, yes. Let's dive into the detail of that. Do you have any advice for people, and this kind of cuts across not just people working in learning abroad, but more generally international, advice for working with, with our cousins out in, out in the faculties on how to, how to optimise collaboration? I, I think the key is that as a learning abroad team, we're a central unit, but our remit is to assist the faculties in implementing what they want to do. So while we have to be sometimes gatekeepers and, you know, we have to follow the policies, we have, have to follow the procedures, I see it as our job is to f- help facilitate that and navigate all of that, the policy procedures, the travel approvals, the risk assessments, the pre-departure information. So if we can standardise that, our job is to not make them try and do more programs or to make them follow all the rules. It's not the gatekeeper, it's the enabler. So it's about supporting the faculties in the initiatives they already want to do. And I also, with the new Colombo plan in particular, the first step they should do when they want to apply for the new Colombo plan is talk to their school. Does it fit and does it align with their own personal agenda, the school's agenda, the faculty's agenda, the university's agenda, then the NCP agenda, before even considering putting in an application? So it's alignment across the whole university and then you get better, greater buy-in and it's providing support for the faculties rather than just the gatekeeper. For the faculties and I think that's put us in good stead with the fact working with them and especially during COVID you know a lot of mobility officers lost staff but we retained all our staff pretty much so other than if people left 
because it was that mental availability. They knew we were there. We knew we were supporting. We knew, they knew we were helping them switch to virtual programs. So it's being, you know, supportive to the faculties makes you worthwhile. What are your sort of touch points with them? Do you do, you do sort of annual activities? Do you have a, a process that you follow in terms of outreach with, with faculties or is it more ad hoc just on a project by project? Uh, a bit of both. So we have, especially just prior to COVID, we had formed learning abroad communities of practice and that was a good way of engaging with the different faculties. We also report in regularly with the Associate Deans International. And from that, we also had sub or additional communities of practice. So the first one, learning abroad, was more general learning abroad for everything. And I I think we're up to about 100 members of different faculties across the university. We then formed one during COVID called virtual learning abroad community of practice where we shared all the faculties shared what they were doing and it inspired others to do it so it was you know I think we had every two months a meeting where we could showcase what was best practice and what was being done and then others could pick up from that and evolve new programs from that area we then have another one which is part of our education focused portfolio, which is the world citizen one. And that's more on the internationalizing the curricula. So we have guest speakers from around the world introducing into that. So that's a big area of engagement. And we can do that all online when we're working remotely, but we can still do it and people can call in from around the world. So there've been an upside of COVID that we've learned to do that rather than meetings face to face regularly. In addition to that, then it's a touch points with project coordinators through the new Colombo plan. We use Entreport to drip feed information to them throughout their project. So we use Entreport for application, then the pro- actual projects that are funded, and then for the student administration. So it's important for us to touch point with an academic once they've received the funding, not necessarily just wait for them to be ready to remind them this is when you should be selecting students or marketing to students. And we drip feed information just in time for when they need it based on when their travel dates are. You mentioned that one of the silver linings of COVID was that that switch to virtual and some better efficiencies in some ways are, and additional opportunities. Now that travel is open again, do you, does your team travel in the same way as it did prior to the pandemic have you have you had a shift in terms of how you handle partners relationships uh, conferences it's on do you anticipate it to go back to where it was before or are you tackling it differently it'll probably be similar to before but having said that we were very limited in our travel so as our team we didn't travel a lot so Based on the student numbers, we can't afford to travel a lot. There's too too many processes. So it was usually only each of us would only go to one or two conferences a year. So it, it wasn't a huge amount of travel that we did as a team. I don't see that will change significantly from pre and post COVID. I think we'll still be following a very similar path. I just want to pick up on a thread that, that you've mentioned a couple of times which is which is mental availability when working with stakeholders. You've mentioned that several times. You've talked about this idea of drip feeding out information or making sure that that you're present. Can can you talk a little bit more about that and how how you view that? And and actually yeah, so in addition to the drip drip feeding, what other th- things you might consider doing in that space? Uh, I think it's just keeping constant touch points with people so that they're aware that we're still here. Once you've got funding, it's easy to get busy with other things and forget to plan early enough. And I think that's the critical point is it causes more workload for us and causes more workload for everyone if the planning's not done early. So it's it's for our own purpose that we're contacting them early, but it's also to maintain the relationships so they know who to go to and they don't follow the wrong process, get too far down the track. It's important for our processes that they're followed in a particular order. There's a lot of compliance things we need to do for the new Colombo plan. We need to get students in by a certain time. We need to do risk managements by a certain time. So 
that constant reminder that, hey, we're still here and, yes, there's another process we need to do, but we can support you with that process, means that the projects continue to go along. Prior to COVID, we actually were particularly good at spending all our money each year. So we didn't have a lot of stockpile of money. Each year we, we would pretty much use all of it. COVID threw a little bit of a spanner in the works and so we, we have had a few projects that couldn't go ahead and, you know, we'll be trying to reinvigorate and grow numbers again because their students are still low. But I think it's that constant reminder that we're here to support, we're here, and it just helps the relationship it helps them stay on track for their project and it helps us tick the boxes for compliance. The more they see you, the more they're familiar, the more they're confident about working with you. What are you most excited about in terms of international ed? They might be learning abroad. It might be something more broadly. It could be specific about New South, Uni of New South. It could be across the industry. I'm excited that the focus is shifting from just students who can afford to travel to students who wouldn't travel. So we're working on programs like looking at accessibility of learning abroad and how we can help students. The new Colombo plan have shifted their focus and, you know, their criteria is how can we include, be more inclusive and include disadvantaged students or students from Indigenous and Torres Strait Island background. And so I'm excited that mobility shifted 20 years ago. It was probably a program for the elite or that, you know, those that could afford to. And so I'm excited that it's becoming a program for everyone. And and I think that's what we should be focusing on is how can we get more students that wouldn't have been able to travel because they learn so much from going abroad. I got an email from a student saying, your job is so cool. You change people's lives. You changed mine. And it's sort of, that's what I'm excited about is being able to continually do that and support those students in, in making that happen. What advice would you have for somebody that's early in their career in terms of in terms of getting into learning abroad and and progressing their career in learning abroad what really tactical things would you suggest that they do short term medium term that's a tough one <laughs> i think it is you have to be passionate for learning abroad so you know in the short term Really think about it, is this something that you're passionate in? Anyone you meet in the learning abroad area is passionate. We don't do it for the money. We do it for the love. So it's, you know, make sure that it's something that you're passionate in. And it's not about going overseas. It's not you travelling. It's sending other people and, and, you know, sitting back and watching other people go abroad. So you've got to be happy with that. And it, it's looking for those sparks of joy. What you will get a lot of complaints, you'll get emails from parents, you'll get all sorts of things, but don't sweat the small stuff. It's those moments of joy of when the student says, you changed my life, that that's what why we do it sort of thing. Longer term, I think it's a case of thinking about where you want to be and what you want to do. And you have to not only think of your own goals, but how does it align with an institution? So what institution do you want to work for? What are their values? What are their goals? Do they align with your personal values and goals? And and that's one of the things we try and do with our team is we talk about what are their values, what are their passions, and and then try and find projects that align that but also align with the university goals. And so as a new person coming up in learning abroad, find your passion, find your niche, and that that's what you want to do and focus projects on. So accessibility in learning abroad or you, if your passion's the environment, how can you teach students about the environment in the pre-departure material? If your passion is career focused, then, you know, how can you integrate career objectives? So find your passion and then how can you integrate it in learning abroad? I have one last question. If I were to open a checkbook, a magical checkbook, and could write you a check for any sum of money that you needed to travel to anywhere in the world and do anything, and you had, let's say, three weeks to go and do it, where would you go and what would you do? <laughs> I, I don't... Hardest question <laughs> on the this podcast, is... right? Say the hardest for <laughs> This is the hardest question. <laughs> I don't know. I If you gave me endless amount of money... I would set up scholarships for students. I really, 
Uh, to, to be honest, I think they are the biggest ambassadors we've got. And I think I might have to go to a few places. I don't think we should focus on one country. So maybe it's a world, round the world trip for me, round the world ticket and trying to locate in diverse regions. The high demand where students want to go, but there's also the places where we can provide so much more to a, a community or, and we can learn so much more from a community. So I think the big thing is providing scholarships, but not just for outbound students, but for inbound students. So a lot of the countries we go to, those countries, their students can't afford to come to Australia. So I think having reciprocal scholarships would be a really mm. powerful thing to be able to offer more to our partners. I feel like sometimes we need to be able to be conscious of not just going in, but how can we actually offer something in return? So I think that's the biggest thing. To change mobility would be to having in more inbound scholarships and so it's a two-way exchange of students. Is there anything random <laughs> that we don't know about you? <laughs> I think you actually know, but others may not know, that I volunteer as a dog trainer. Tell us more. Yeah, dog training is actually an interesting thing because it you have to be mindful, you have to be present, and you have to be concentrating on what you're doing. So it actually taught me to be mindful. But it also taught me about people management and student management, and, and I actually use it in my day-to-day -day because it's about watching for the signals. So, you know, are they in distress? Are they, what are they thinking about? Are they fearful? Are they angry? Well, so it's watching and listening to what people are saying, the same as you would watch and listen to a dog. So it's actually a really interesting volunteering area to do because it, it translates to, you know, what's, what's the treat for the dog? The little bit of kibble's not working, but the chicken does. So likewise, what's the treat for a student to read? <laughs> you need the, you'd need to use the chicken, not the kibble. So it, it's an interesting way of sort of being able to look at and analyze people and how to motivate people. That's fascinating. And look, have you, have you got one example? That could be applied to humans like one thing that you notice for example if you're in a meeting and you look you, you pick up some sort of cue is there one that that's really easy to share uh, i think it it's not necessarily an easy thing but watching people and what motivates people so the same as what motivates a dog is it a toy is it a treat is it praise that's the same with students or team members or staff. It's watching what motivates them. When do they light up? When's that excitement moment? And then that's what you can use to motivate them in the future. So, for instance, the new Colombo plan, money might motivate them, but often that's not the motivation for our student. It's aligning with the sustainability development goals or being engaging in a community that's their passion. So... Finding what motivates people is probably the, the easiest thing, that are, the best thing that I've learned from dog training that you could put in every day, like what motivates them and then how can you use that to sort of build success for the future for them. Your uh, volunteering with dog training to me speaks to your generosity because when we were asking you about, Rob was asking you about the travel and you answer about scholarships and I, I, I think that, It's symptomatic to me of how you think. Is I think you think a lot of others, and whether it's with the students, the dogs, it's very much about how to make it a better experience. And you were mentioning receiving a student's email saying, "Oh, your job is so cool. You make you know you improve people's lives." And I, I think that's something that yeah, you really do, and it, it shows. I think that's indicative of the industry. Everyone you meet that's in learning abroad is passionate about what they do. You know, that they're, they're doing it to enhance the student experience. It's not, you know, for their own gain. Well, we get gain from, you know, the students, I guess, but it's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but no, Michelle, if someone handed me a check, I'm off to see the Northern Lights here <laughs> <in> Norway. <laughs> incredibly generous and we're, we're, we're very much better for it as an industry. Well, I, I did have the advantage just before COVID set in, I went to Antarctica for a month at the, on a cruise. So oh, was fantastic. It? it was, you know, life changing. We went from Uruguay to Falkland Island, south of Georgia and down to the Antarctic Peninsula. So I feel like I've done my holy grail of travel, <laughs> but 
if, you know, I might go to the Northern Lights to scope out some mobility options now. <laughs> South Georgia, for those people who don't know where it is, here we're talking off the southeast coast of South America. You've got this wild set of islands that are basically just lashed by Antarctic winds. What's that like? Oh, it's phenomenal. It's I've never seen so many animals, uh, you know, seals and penguins as far as you can see the penguins and it was molting season so there's feathers everywhere and it's the landscape is just phenomenal you you can never see it and we went kayaking you know sort of about 12 times throughout the thing and one day you're going through cold water then you're going through a thin layer of ice where you're cracking the ice with the paddles to get through and other days there's chunks of ice that you're going through so it was just a phenomenal experience. Was it scary at any time? Not really. I think my only scary point was when we, a leopard seal was following us mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was a little bit nervous about a leopard seal, but the rest of the time it was it was very safe. Yeah. It's not very often I get travel envy, but, Maureen, I think we've got another <laughs> one to add to the list. <laughs> <laughs> this is not getting any shorter. It's not getting any shorter. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> so you won't be giving me the money. You'll be keeping it now. <laughs> <laughs> There's no money. It was very much hypothetical yeah. money. <laughs> Michelle, it's been awesome chatting with you on on the podcast today. I'd love to do a round two at at, at some stage because I know you're you're a wealth of knowledge. Very generous with the way that you share that with learning board practitioners around the country. So thanks for joining us on today's episode of Global Horizons. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.